Amid the mild uncertainty around a path forward following the results of Flight 8, SpaceX is soldiering on, testing the next ship in line and continuing work on future flight vehicles. With Flight 8 now in the past, SpaceX has also resumed work at Pad B, going full steam ahead on preparing the infrastructure that will support future launch and catch operations of Block 2 and Block 3 vehicles, hopefully in the near future. I'm Max Evans with NSF, and this is your Starbase Update. While the outcome of Flight 8 still feels bittersweet, SpaceX is keeping the ball rolling and preparations are well underway for the next flight. Just a few days after Flight 8, Ship 35 exited Mega Bay 2 and rolled up Highway 4 to Massey's in order to begin its cryogenic proof test campaign. This serves as a critical milestone in the life of a ship as it gets ready for flight. However, it's worth recalling that each and every one of them begins their life in the Star Factory as coils of steel before eventually morphing into barrel sections and nose cones. Then, said barrel sections and nose cones are relocated to Mega Bay 2 and are stacked inside section by section. Once stacking is complete, the ship is moved into one of the workstations inside of the Mega Bay. There, SpaceX teams spend a few weeks outfitting the vehicle to prepare it for cryogenic proof testing at Massey's. This cryogenic proof testing is done by installing the ship on a special stand, which we often refer to as the ship thrust simulator. This has six rods located where each Raptor engine would be. These rods push against the aft end of the ship when it's stable and full of cryogenic fluid in order to simulate the forces and thrust from all six Raptors during flight. Since the sea level Raptor engines attach to the thrust puck in the middle, the rods for those push against the thrust puck of the ship. And because the Raptor vacuum engines are attached directly to the aft dome of the ship, those rods extend higher and push against the dome's interfaces where the RVACs will eventually be installed. That being said, having seen Ship 33 fail on Flight 7 due to excessive vibrations and Ship 34 suffering a rather similar fate on Flight 8, it begs the question if SpaceX could eventually build a similar stand but one serving to replicate the intense vibrations and acoustics during flight. Sounds strange, but they have built weirder contraptions. During its time at Massey's, Ship 35 went through three different rounds of cryogenic proof testing. The first on March 11th, followed by the second and third on March 12th. After these tests concluded, Ship 35 was eventually rolled back into Mega Bay 2 the following day, March 13th. With these steps in the campaign now complete, teams will continue work on Ship 35, now preparing it for the installation of its six Raptor engines. Once installed, Ship 35 will return to Massey's, this time for engine testing. Now, it's fair to wonder why SpaceX would continue with Ship 35 testing so quickly after the outcome of Flight 8, but we should note that, at least in previous occasions, most of the major retrofits aimed to resolve any issues found during previous flights have taken place between cryo and engine testing. Before the rollout for cryo testing, Ship 35 was located in the center workstation inside Mega Bay 2, but after it rolled back, it was installed on the left-hand side of the building outside of our view. This means that the next time we see it, it may very well have had any and all retrofits installed in attempts to get Ship 35 to a nominal seco. Whether or not any of these retrofits will work on the other hand, that's what the next flight is for. What's really interesting though, is that right after Ship 35 rolled the Masseys, the production site received a small batch of what looked like Starlink simulators, precisely like the ones we've seen from Flight 7 and Flight 8. It seems safe to assume that SpaceX will attempt to deploy these for Flight 9, since they haven't had the opportunity yet. However, we're still waiting for official word on the plan for Flight 9, so we'll have to wait and see. It's also worth mentioning that Ship 35 has structurally mounted catch pins, unlike Ship 33 and Ship 34, which had non-structural catch pins installed purely for atmospheric reentry testing. It's unlikely that SpaceX would attempt to catch this ship without proving that Block 2 can at least survive ascent, but weirder things have happened. Still waiting on official word, of course. While Ship 35 was at Massey's, it was accompanied by Booster 16, which was also undergoing its own set of cryogenic proof tests. Booster 16 had rolled out to Massey's a bit earlier than Ship 35, on February 28th to be exact, just before Flight 8 occurred. Just like ships, the boosters begin their lives in the Star Factory as coils of steel that are turned into barrel sections. These barrels roll out to Mega Bay 1 and get stacked to form the structure of a booster. Inside, the booster spends a few weeks being outfitted with pressure lines, raceways, and more hardware that will enable it to hold pressure in addition to commanding and actuating its tank valves. This is enough to classify as ready for cryogenic proof testing in a very similar way as we have outlined for ships. Boosters also have a thrust simulator stand, albeit different, 
to accommodate for the design of the booster. Boosters have 33 engines, of course, compared to the ship's six, and are also attached to the vehicle differently. This stand also has rods that push up onto the booster's aft end, but only 13 of the 33 Raptor engines are attached to the aft cap located on the aft dome. That's a lot of afts. I'm sorry. <laughs> the other 20 engines are attached to the outer rim of the booster, and that section does not hold any cryogenic fluids. So, because of this, the thrust simulator stand only has 13 rods for the inner engines. SpaceX began testing Booster 16 right away, with the first crowd test happening on February 28th, followed by another round on March 4th. The strange thing, though, is that since the last crowd test on March 4th, SpaceX hasn't tested Booster 16 again or at least as of this recording. Things change pretty rapidly in Starbase, so it's worth noting. This seems unusual because if additional testing is needed, you might think we'd have seen that by now. But if testing is complete, it seems puzzling as to why it hasn't been rolled back to Mega Bay 1 yet. If it's assigned to Flight 9, it should get back to the production site as soon as possible for engine installation and testing at the launch site. Notice the emphasis on if. Maybe, just maybe, it isn't assigned to Flight 9, and SpaceX could be attempting to refly Booster 14, as we've seen this booster receiving work inside of Mega Bay 1 as recently as a few weeks ago, and it hasn't left since its return from Flight 7. That being said, SpaceX will soon run into storage issues inside of Mega Bay 1, given that boosters 14, 15, and 17 are already inside, and there are only three workstations in there. That means booster 16 may have to stay outside for a bit longer if it's not being flown soon. Even if a flight-proven booster flies next, the lack of storage space would still be an issue unless SpaceX decides to expend the vehicle or retire it to the rocket garden after a catch from Flight 9, should that occur. So at the moment, it seems appropriate and fair to approach SpaceX and say, you're gonna need a bigger bay. You're gonna to need a bigger boat. The Jaws reference, for those of you who are cultured. Now, those potential storage issues that we were just talking about, SpaceX might already be working on a solution to that. In the lead up to Flight 8, SpaceX provided a massive update talking precisely about building a bay larger than the Mega Bay, dubbed Giga Bay. The update wasn't talking about a Starbase Giga Bay though, but rather one that SpaceX is going to build right here on the Space Coast. For those that watch our videos covering the Space Coast, it probably came as no surprise as we have already seen preparation, not just in paperwork, but also groundwork for this new structure in Florida. Giga Bay will have about 11 times the footprint of the current Mega Bays, and SpaceX says it would be able to accommodate 24 work cells for integration and refurbishment of ships and boosters alike. A far cry from the combined six work cells across Mega Bay 1 and 2 in Starbase. As we are familiar with by now, SpaceX plans to build and launch Starships from right here on the Space Coast. In addition to the new Giga Bay, SpaceX will construct a gargantuan 1.5 million square foot factory and office building that will be connected to it. Together, they would dwarf the current layout at Starbase, but such a project will take some time to come together, even on SpaceX or Elon time. SpaceX themselves says this won't be completed until the end of 2026. Seems far away at the moment, but trust me, that'll be here before we know it. Regarding launch operations, we've seen some work ramping up over at LC-39A in the last six months or so in order to prepare for Starship's first flight from Florida. That first launch, SpaceX says, is targeting the end of this year, which is a bit sooner than the anticipated completion of Starship factory operations here. So in the meantime, SpaceX says that they will be shipping vehicles from Starbase out to Florida and build up a fleet of ships and boosters here right on the Space Coast. But also in this update, they snuck in the fact that SpaceX plans to build a gigabay at Starbase as well, with a similar completion time at the end of 2026. This wasn't a huge surprise given that we had seen a job posting from Starbase a while back mentioning Gigabay, so it was clear that Starbase would also have this structure. In order to build such a massive facility in Starbase, others will have to go to make room, and one of the first might be the high bay. In recent months, we've seen that SpaceX has been slowly dismantling it, stripping some of its hardware, including the welding turntable that was used to stack so many SN vehicles and Block 1 ships. SpaceX also seems to have started to install scaffolding 
that will help strip this building further before demolition and has put up barriers to block personnel from coming near. On SpaceX's update of Florida operations, the company shared a render of how the Star Factory and Gigabay structures will look once completed. One thing to note is how similarly the factory and bays are connected compared to Starbase's factory joined to Megabay 2. Also in recent weeks, SpaceX has closed off the Star Factory extension leading to the ring yard and is building a wall that will close it off from the rest of the facility. Notices at the entrance warn of upcoming work to demolish the high bay and remove part of the factory. SpaceX may build the Gigabay at the current entrance, connecting it to this extension, potentially obscuring future views of Starship production. All of this means that while SpaceX is solving the storage issue, they'll have to live with these growing pains and changes for the foreseeable future until Gigabay is up and running, which should be interesting to follow. SpaceX's expansive and ambitious Starship production aims to realize the company's vision of sending humans to Mars and establishing a multi-planetary existence. This commitment is evident not only in their dedicated efforts to develop Starship, but also in the numerous artworks the company has secured throughout its history. This includes the mural that the company built on the side of the parking garage located behind the high bay at Rubidios Avenue. The mural depicts a future where starships are parked next to multiple settlements on Mars. It had been damaged in a storm a month or so ago, and after a few weeks of work, SpaceX has completed repairs. Interestingly, they chose to include what looks like Block 3 ships in the background instead of the old Block 1 ships that were up before. Maybe that was fate's way of telling them to update. Now, of course, we are still years out from that becoming a reality. However, SpaceX seems to be pushing ahead to make it a reality sooner rather than later. This week, Elon Musk reiterated plans to launch Starship to Mars by late 2026, aligning with the next Mars transfer window, a goal SpaceX has recently emphasized across multiple Starship flights, though the number of ships remains unclear. The initial uncrewed missions, a long-standing plan, won't carry humans, but could include a robot, with Elon aiming to send Tesla's Optimus on the first Mars-bound mission. Humans are slated to follow in the 2029 window, though SpaceX's CEO cautions it may slip to 2031 or later, given Elon time and the immense challenges ahead. A lengthy checklist precedes even an uncrewed Mars launch, and any failure could delay SpaceX another window or two for fixes and retries. Unlike the rapid seven-week turnaround between Flight 7 and 8, a fails Mars landing, a ship leaving a crater perhaps, means waiting two or more years for the next attempt. One potential workaround is that they could launch multiple ships out to Mars to increase their chances of success by sheer numbers, but if there's anyone with a realistic chance of pulling this off, it's SpaceX. As always, a little patience will be required. Before the first uncrewed Starship launches to Mars, SpaceX must ensure that Block 2 ships no longer fail mid-flight. We previously discussed Ship 35, set for the next flight, but recent weeks have shown significant progress on Ship 36 as well. It's been some time since we last checked in on Ship 36, but this week its aft section was spotted moving into Mega Bay 2, suggesting it's likely fully assembled now. If all proceeds smoothly, Ship 36 could fly on Flight 10. Seemingly far off, but it'll be here before we know it. The Starship excitement extends beyond Ship 36. This week, SpaceX moved Ship 37's pre-assembled nose cone and a payload base stack from the Star Factory into Mega Bay 2. SpaceX pre-joins these sections in the factory to streamline stacking before entering Mega Bay 2. Once inside, Teams hoist the stack and lower it around the PEZ dispenser to install it within the payload bay. Stacking then continues in Mega Bay 2, culminating with the aft section, the same one recently noted for Ship 36. What stands out about this section is the absence of numerous heat shield tiles on its nose and payload bay, along with its missing forward flaps typically added in the factory. It seems SpaceX hurried it out of the Star Factory in an incomplete state. This might make sense if they were churning out ships in needed space, but a glance through the glass windows and the nose cone line reveals that just one other in progress, likely for Ship 38. That one's already receiving its thermal tiles and could soon be mated to its payload bay section. One possibility is that SpaceX is trying to push these nose cones out while the Star Factory's large side door remains accessible. As mentioned earlier, that extension may soon be removed, providing a strong incentive to expedite the process. However, none of these vehicles could fly without the critical launch infrastructure. Following Flight 8, after Booster 15 left the launch mount, teams resume work on the pad systems to prepare the next flight. This involves inspecting hardware, repairing and refurbishing as needed, and upgrading pad systems whenever possible. Post-launch tradition includes reinstalling scaffolding and the OLM work platform, nicknamed the Dance Floor, at the launch mount, along with repositioning the booster alignment pins atop it. Following recent catches, SpaceX routinely lowers the chopsticks to the tower's base, 
leaving them open to inspect the arms and bumpers that contact the booster. Flight Edge Catch barely marked the bumpers, which is great news. Afterwards, the arms resumed their usual stance, ascending the tower, closing, and sliding off to the side. During post-flight work, teams placed a lot of attention on the Booster Quick Disconnect, or BQD, which endures the intense force of all 33 Raptor engines. This is vividly captured in SpaceX's stunning slow-motion video from Flight 8, showing the booster's engine ignition and the liftoff from the launch mount camera. As the video ends, the booster clears the launch ring and blasting the Raptor exhaust onto the mount and the quick disconnect. After Flight 8, teams were also spotted working on high-pressure tanks for the Deluge tank farm at Pad A. The purpose remains unclear, but it'll likely become evident eventually. Launch site efforts extend beyond Pad A over to Pad B, where some hardware still remains off-site. At the Sanchez lot, SpaceX has spent months constructing a brand new, massive launch mount and water-cooled flame bucket for eventual installation at the launch site, hopefully soon. Significant progress is evident on the new launch mount, now featuring a large water manifold on its side. This, along with other pipes, will channel substantial water flow to the water mount's water-cooled top deck, shielding it from the ferocity of 33 Raptor engines as seen in SpaceX's recent slow-motion video. At the launch site, preparations persist for the launch tower and its Mechazilla system. Just before Flight 8, the chopsticks ascended the tower for the first time, initially a short distance, then in later tests reaching nearly halfway up before descending. Since those tests, no further movement has occurred, but teams appear to be refining the system, suggesting more tests may come soon. It is critical that the alignment and function of the carriage and chopstick system is perfect before taking on the loads of boosters and ships. Teams are also diligently assembling a new gantry at the launch site, likely to secure connections for Pad B's launch mount. Currently, this sizable structure is just a framework, but its design and the launch mount's progress suggest it will align closely with the mount, enabling direct connections for water, high-pressure gases, and other resources. Uncertainty surrounds the booster umbilical setup. Whether it'll feature one quick disconnect port, two, or more remains unclear. We will find out as construction advances, likely incorporating lessons learned from Pad A and its history of launches. While some structures are being built, the SpaceX-branded LR-11000 crane at the launch site appears to be in the process of disassembly. For reasons unclear, teams have begun taking this crane apart and have removed it from Starbase. It's an unusual move given how vital this crane, purchased by SpaceX, has been for various tasks over its three plus years of service there. Its sudden departure adds to the oddities at Starbase this week. More practically, SpaceX might be redeploying it for their numerous construction projects, especially as they aim to transform Starbase into a city. Perhaps it'll even resurface for Gigabay construction. Time will tell. Another major focus at the launch site is the orbital tank farm, which has seen numerous upgrades in recent times. Before Flight 8, SpaceX added new tanks, and in the past week, they have been relentlessly installing more pipes and additional hardware. On a side note, for the next Starship launch, they might need to reinforce the vaporizers. Some were damaged in the last flight, requiring repairs. They will be back up and running well before the next flight. So stay tuned to Starbase Live and keep an eye out. Despite the question marks raised, we had a lot of good information to look over, including future operations across the US. Starship operations are not slowing down, and there is still plenty more to come in the near future. I'm Max Evans for NSF, and thanks for tuning in.